Hi, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. Just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Fall Campaign is ending soon on December 6th. You still have time to make an impact for preachers around the globe. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift during the campaign, and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. We need your help to continue providing resources to church leaders like you. Thank you for supporting this vital work. And don't forget to make your gift during the campaign to unlock all of the Craft of Preaching resources from the Sold Out October Conference. We appreciate you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday of Advent on December 6, 2020, are Isaiah 41 through 11, Psalm 85, verses 1 and 2 and 8 through 13, 2 Peter 3, 8 through 15a, and Mark 1, 1 through 8. Happy second Sunday of Advent, everybody. It's great. Back, yeah, we're off and month, running. Yeah, month we of missed December. You last, last time, but we know this is your favorite uh, season of the church year, correct? This is my favorite season of the church year. So, yes. it'll be especially helpful this year, I think, <laughs> <laughs> as a way of navigating, you know, pandemic loneliness and frustration and isolation and all of those things that 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 people are going through. It's an Mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how, um, at least in the United States and a lot of other countries, it'll be interesting to see how Advent resonates in some ways this year. A season of waiting during a time when we're all waiting. waiting. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess, you know, the first thing that uh, struck me this year, and I did an Advent uh, Bible study with a few pastors a few weeks ago and thinking about this text. And uh, really coming down on the image of the wilderness and the desert and, uh, and this really decentering of God's good news or God's presence or that uh, God is found on the edges and also belongs there. And I think that could have a kind of resonance this year when people are struggling to uh, think about theologically what all of this means when they're not able to meet God, if you will, in their usual places, spaces of worship, uh, volunteering, um, those kinds of acts of discipleship that, that has been a part of their faith lives for years and years and years. And, and the practice obviously of, and ritual of going to church and to worship. And, uh, and maybe that's what Mark can help us uh, remember and remind us of this year is that uh, God is not where um, we expect God to be, that God, you know, this story starts out in the wilderness and in the desert. Um, and yet that's where the good news, the gospel, your God is here, uh, is present. So that would be, I think, maybe one homiletical direction people could take. Yeah, the wilderness theme is great. It's, you know, things are hard in the wilderness. Things also sometimes become more clear in the, in the wilderness where God shows up in, in different ways. And uh, I know some churches are experiencing that, a, a kind of um, clarification of their purpose or their mission uh, in the midst of everything else being cut off and being kind of cut down to essentials in some cases, even in terms of finances where all of the stuff isn't possible. And so there's a way in which, uh, yeah, the wilderness is not just wandering around waiting and suffering. It's, it's also to have eyes to see uh, new opportunities showing up as well. Yeah, it's a revealing place, right? It's an exposing place and it's a revealing place. And so uh, if, you, if you read ahead a little bit, uh, and think, and in Mark to uh, Jesus opening words in Mark, because uh, here we are uh, in the gospel of Mark for this year. And you read ahead to uh, 
Jesus, the first things, you know, the first words that Jesus says in this gospel, um, Mark 1, 14 to 15, uh, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, repent and believe in that, in that good news, Repl repent and believe in God's presence. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's that world, that wilderness that uh, is revealing uh, if we're, a, if we're looking uh, what, what that presence of the kingdom of God. So there's that, uh, that I, I really like that about the commentary of reminding us that the wilderness is just, is not always desert and desolate, but a, but a place of revelation and a place of, and a place of, um, uh, of, re yeah, of revealing. In this passage too, it's a place like you, you mentioned repentance coming in verses 14 to 15. That's also a key part of John's ministry, that this is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And one of the ways people participate in that here in, in Mark in verse five is that people come out to the Jordan confessing that in John's ministry, at least, the, the wilderness is also a place of, of confessing. And I've been, been thinking a lot about confession recently and, and repentance over the last six months or so uh, in my own congregation, in my own life, thinking about the power of that word and, and not thinking about confession as a one-time thing that you do, that you, you, know, you pray the prayer and the worship leader tells you you're forgiven uh, and the community pronounces you forgiven and then you move on as if, well, we took care of that now, but the ways in which confession is ongoing and the ways in which confession is communal and the ways in which confession is really necessary before you can have things like reconciliation, that, that first there has to be a shared understanding of what's true. Uh, so even that word confession, right, is the idea of, of speaking out in accord, right? P speaking out publicly uh, to come to a mutual reckoning about what's true, which happens between individuals and God, but it also happens within communities and among communities, um, which might be a good thing to sit with for a little bit because I think in our traditions, we're all used to doing confession at a certain point in the worship service, but then the point is, well, then we get over it and then we move on to what real discipleship might look like. Um, but discipleship is also this ongoing posture of confession. And I think especially now, especially given some of the, the many crises that the church is facing, uh, at least where we live. Uh, what, what strikes me about about confession is that our society is really good at uh, teaching people to confess other people's sins. So we're really good. At, at, I'm really good at confessing, you know, your sins, Matt, and you're really good at confessing mine and knowing what I've done wrong and not knowing what you've done wrong. But that confess that's not confession, right? That's actually blame. The, the ability, like you just said, to corporately, uh, create a, a ritual space where I confess my sins and I face them and you face yours is uh, so countercultural that uh, the rest of the culture doesn't know what to do with it. And to me, that's the, that's the incredibly good news in, in, in my tradition. Um, historically, we start every, every worship service with that. And it's just, a, it's such a wonderful good news space to start that with the, with the intellectual and spiritual honesty to say, everything is not right with me in me. And that we all do that together um, over and over again um, as, as, the, as the basis on which Advent happens. God comes to me and I come to God. I really appreciate uh, both of those uh, positions, the corporate nature that you're calling for, Ralph, and also um, uh, what you call posture, Matt. Um, uh, it, it signaled for me a way of life. And uh, I had begun to, in the, in the sense of this beginning in the wilderness, I, 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 I love it when it's this text because uh, this is the season for me of great expectations and you, you have to have something great 
um, if you're wandering in the wilderness. And that seems to be where we have spent this this uh, last year, wandering in the wilderness. But the need, the need is for um, someone to name for the community what is true. Um, so just bringing together what, what each of you have already said. And I really also appreciated the commentate, uh, commentary because of the acknowledgement that the voice the, 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 is the forerunner. So the one that is calling attention to gather the corporate uh, community is preparing the way for the appearance of the Lord. It's preparing the way for God's showing up. And so it's not about me. It's not about the one who is the voice. It is about the one that it, we are bearing witness to. And that just leaves me in a spirit of great expectation. Yeah, I appreciated that angle in the commentary as well, uh, Joy, of, of inviting us to, uh, to recognize those who pave the way, who are not always in the spotlight, <laughs> uh, but uh, to, to see, the, as, she, as, as she put it, the necessity of those who are antecedents of change setting the stage for an alternative future. And so the ways in which we are, uh, th that we do recognize those persons and those people who uh, point to that change and who are that voice. And I think also then, as you were alluding to, an invitation to imagine ourselves in that same position, uh, that, uh, that we are, that how are, how are we the voice? How are we paving the way? How are we antecedents of change? Uh, where do we see, how might we be doing the same? And so maybe the preacher could uh, reflect on that a little bit as well of, of an invitation to the congregation to imagine themselves in that same kind of role. And, and it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not the spotlight role. It's not the, it's not the uh, top billing role, but it's equally as important uh, and 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 really and really crucial, and I think people can um, I think people could relate to that. Should we jump to Isaiah forty? There's a few good things sure. in here. There's a few good things in here you could build a sermon off of, perhaps. You should should be able to. You know, it starts so innocently. I mean, in terms of connecting to John's ministry, because of course John's quoting from here and also from Malachi, but. Uh, a, a different setting, this idea of, of return, of, of coming back from exile. I, I appreciate that Michael Chan talks about how, you know, this is in a sense the beginning of second Isaiah, but most people don't realize there are multiple Isaiahs and there's nothing to indicate from chapter 39 to chapter 40 that you've, you've jumped into a new setting, at least that the most people I don't think would recognize on a first reading. But so here now is this this new hope, right? This this new perspective on what's possible for Judah post exile, and the image of of comfort there that God's first um, well, I don't know. I guess the first oracle here, at least in this chapter, is this idea of what God wants is is not um, not recompense. You know, God's not saying now, now are you finally sorry? Are you finally really sorry now? But this idea of a God who reaches out with comfort to those who, who need comfort to begin the hard work of restoration. I appreciate also, Matt, um, bringing up the fact that there is a significant shift that is happening between chapter 39 and chapter 40 that we don't get in our reading. And uh, so I, I was grateful uh, that Michael Chan brought that up in the commentary. And again, that you lift it up. Uh, what happens at the end of 39 is um, Israel is in its worst, uh, in its best position. It, it, is, it is postured with all the glory, all the power, all the attention. It's its um, leader has just um, uh, sitting at the table to negotiate peace in the Middle East and tells the prophet this. And Isaiah's response is, oh, no. And, and so 39 is the beginning of troubles. But it, it, it is reported at the height of their uh, success. 
So when you take that recognition of, of how 39 uh, is, is positioned historically, you move into chapter 40, which is actually in the midst of exile. It's in the midst of their suffering. It's when they need comforting the most. It's when they aren't experiencing. It's, it's when they're in the wilderness, if we use, if we use that Mark uh, uh, idea. And it is in that deepest pit, in that darkest hour, that the prophet's words say, this is when God is saying, comfort my people. It, it, and again, I love how the lectionary just seems to set alive the word today because that's exactly where we are right now. We are in the midst of a pandemic at the end of our ropes where it, it seems that we cannot negotiate peace in uh, our, our, across our dinner table, let know across the globe. And this is a place where the people of God have a, a message from the Creator whose intention for the world is that the people would be comforted. Okay, maybe there is something to preach out of Isaiah. Well, I'm absolutely, right? Um, they'll be comforted this idea of um, what they have gone through hasn't escaped God's notice, which like you said in verse 39, isn't just randomness. I mean, that part of what's involved here has been um, bad leadership. It's been neglect um, from Judah's, uh, Judah's leader up to this point. It's not just a, um, none of this is viewed as like as random, right? Or as, as coincidental. And where we go with that theologically, of course, can be dangerous in terms of how we, how we talk about that or how we think about our people's own suffering. But that's not the prophet's job here. At least the prophet's job at this chapter doesn't appear to be to try to read God's mind uh, or intentions, maybe I should say instead, but is to say God is now here in a position of comfort. And this idea of a way for the Lord to walk upon, to lead exiles back home is um is appropriately celebratory Absolutely. i think another important connection uh with isaiah and and then in particular the mark text is that term good news uh which we actually get in uh isaiah 40 verse 9 uh ozion herald of good tidings herald of good tidings uh that's uh, for the Greek nerds out there, that's a masculine nominative singular participle of Ewangelizo uh, in the Septuagint. So it's the one who shares the good news, the one who brings the good news. And then, of course, Mark uses that Evangelion in, in, uh, in the first verse of Mark and the beginning of the good news. And the announcement of good news in verse 9 is, here is your God. Your God is here. And uh, the, that resonance then with the audience of Mark uh, when uh, for all intents and purposes, that's the theological question uh, given uh, the fall of the temple and the raising of Jerusalem, uh, is God really here or not? And so that's another angle, I, I, a homiletical angle, I think on this text, you know, depending on how the preacher uh, and sees what, they, what their congregation needs to hear. Uh, but that that questioning of God's presence and 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 the, that the good news quite literally is you know gospel or good news your God is here, and then what God does when God's there is you know specific to each text. But that's the claim of the good news, and maybe sometimes we forget that that you know we we over theologize gospel, <laughs> uh, and and in fact, all what it is is to make that promise and that claim of God's presence. Uh, your God is here, and if you fast forward to Isaiah fifty two, your God reigns. Um, that's the that your God is victorious. Your God is present, and so that's I think key. There, uh... I'm, I'm silent about Isaiah 40 because I'm overwhelmed. There's, uh, as you said, there's a lot here. There, there's too much for me as someone uh, who spent so much time in this short, short passage to say. It's First of all, it's a call story. This is the call story of second Isaiah. Even if you're a, a biblical reader who doesn't buy into first and second Isaiah and says, there's only one Isaiah, it's still 
a time shift from 39 to 40, you're still addressing the exiles. Um, so it's a call story and a sending story. And then the, the, the verse you're talking about in specific, Caroline, verse nine, uh, for a long time just really puzzled me, just as a reader of the uh, Old Testament. Get up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. By the way, in Hebrew, not a masculine participle, but a feminine participle, because Jerusalem, all cities are feminine in Hebrew. And so Jerusalem is supposed to get up to a high mountain and then say to the cities of Judah, I couldn't figure out poetically what that was about for a long time, because you go to Babylon and say to the cities of Judah, your God is about to show up. And to, the, the resolution for me eventually came when I realized, for at least for my own reading, you're still the cities of Judah, even though you're in Babylon. That is your identity as God's people hasn't changed. You're still God's, you're still the cities of Judah, even though you've been 40 years in Babylon. And so it's identity and relationship. And God is coming to you across the desert. God is coming through the wilderness. God is coming to you in your exile, in your loneliness. And I think, you know, uh, in this time of isolation, that's, uh, that overflows with bounty, you know, that God still will arrive at your door in your uh, loneliness, uh, depression, and, and all the rest. The same God that's always been on that journey with God's people, the same God yesterday, and telling this story ancient uh, for the ancient Israelites, their yesterday God was their today God. And we rehearse that story in our wilderness in after our pandemic with great expectation that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've got a nice occasion this Sunday where the Psalm I think actually squares pretty well with both the, both the first reading and also the gospel too, with, in terms of talking about pardoning of sin, in terms of talking about uh, you know, the Lord needing a path or following along a path and this idea of, of, of good fortune returning. Plus it's got these lovely lines about you know, righteousness and, um, and peace kissing one another and the poetry of this Psalm is, is great. I don't say this very often, but this is a psalm that could actually get some 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 good billing in a sermon. <laughs> At least this Sunday. All right, let's go on to Second Peter then. So, no, it, it you're right, and I think uh, you know again that promise of of steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness and peace will kiss each other. I mean, if I were going to preach on this sermon, that's where I would land. Uh, is verse 10. And just to, uh, it, you know, kind of um, tease out what that, uh, what that looks like, what that metaphor, what that image has, a, might have in mind for us. Uh, and, and uh, because it's so, it's so, um, it's so intriguing, and so beautiful, yet so mysterious. <laughs> uh, and there's something really uh, quite extraordinary about that sort of tension um, in which we in which we live of that of that uh, you know the the, tangi the the tangibility of of love and faithfulness righteousness and peace but yet at the same time uh, there when all of those things seem so far away and uh, that might be exactly where people are sitting right now too and so it might be a, a way to kind of acknowledge that that particular place in people's lives. I was waiting for Rolf to jump in, uh, but I, I agree with uh, both of you. And um, obviously, from uh, my final comments, I come at this from the faithfulness piece. 
um, that you know that that trustworthiness uh, consistency of God but it seems that no matter which text we choose this week the story is going to be uh, offering the same good news yeah the it, it's it's really hard to preach on abstract poetry and, and and the abstraction of verses 10 through 13 especially is so um uh, okay i just I'm, I'm gonna break a fundamental rule of english is i'm gonna say it's so poetic that is the characteristics of god's uh uh, God's ontological characteristics. Like if you look at Exodus 34, where God's name and God's character are revealed, what are what uh, they're described, God's character is described as these words, steadfast love, faithfulness. Um, and this, they're, they're actually given then tangible expression poetically as um, things that are physical, Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up. Righteousness will look down and so on. Um, so that God's character then is poetically expressed as tangible uh, doing things. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think I've ever dared to try to preach on this because I, I wouldn't know how, but it's just beautiful. It, it, in some way, it's a forerunner of the incarnation. That is that these characteristics of God are incarnate here in the poetry. And of course, that's exactly what happens in Jesus. Okay, second we, Peter. Yeah, I was yeah, gonna say, should we jump to second Peter? Yeah, and a lot of uh, overlapping You shouldn't themes, ignore, right? but do not ignore <laughs> second Peter. <laughs> But you know, it, I was reading. I was reading this uh, again because you know you have to, and uh, and it. Uh, but what's what was really striking is just it's it's almost like you have all the Advent themes all rolled into one, <laughs> in this one passage, uh, and so, uh, which made me just think of, okay, that's a great lectionary choice way to go, lectionary revised common lectionary committee, uh, especially since you know Second Peter is something people could pass over pretty quickly or not even remember this in the New Testament. Uh, but I, it made me think of just how, you know, Advent is not like a, a made up thing, um, but sorry, can you hear the, uh, the phone in the background there? <laughs> That's my, um, my host's landline is ringing. Uh, I might have to unplug that, but Anyway, uh, and but that 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 these sort of these convergence of realities of waiting, of of time, of uh, of of you know of patience, uh, the hastening of the coming of the day that, that that's always been a part of the Christian life, uh, of these you, that these that these all of these things intermingle. Uh, and and are and and converge, and so it. I, I just that was that really struck me about this passage that uh, that this is this is really representative of what of how the early, uh, you know, how the writers of the New Testament were really um, describing what does what does faith in Jesus mean, and 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 it is this uh, uh, really um, extraordinary. Uh, convergence, as I said, of these, of these realities all at the same time. One of the things I love about this particular text, I, I, I've worked with it against, a, I think it's a John Lennon song that says, if there's a God in heaven, what's he waiting for? And it just describes everything that is still wrong in the world with this sense of really you know, it, it doesn't seem like what God's intervention is, is actually to use our other texts comforting. And um, in verse nine here, I, I'm really struck by the answer to that skeptical question, that disappointing question of what is God waiting for? It's, it's God is waiting because God is not wanting anyone to be lost for not wanting any to perish. 
And that's a good news in the sense of God's patience with me when I'm being reluctant or hesitant to humbling myself, to trusting God, to, to giving myself over to God, it is that God is saying, I, I, I'm going to hold out for you because what I got for you is good. And, and so I really appreciate um, this uh, verse nine, uh, that this is God's, God's timing of slowness is God's gift of grace in our own lack of belief. Yeah, I totally agree. This is a passage that has to recalibrate our ways of thinking about time or efficiency or progress and, and things like that. It's, and it comes from a, a somewhat nervous book Second Peter in general, you know, this is probably the last of the New Testament writings to be written, very concerned about people who are leaving the church because Christ hasn't come back. So just attrition and just saying over again, you know, you can trust the apostles, you can trust them, they know what they were talking about. when they promised Jesus was going to come back, which in some ways feels a bit like ministry for a lot of people today, which is uh, helping people adjust expectations around timing. About when we're going to worship in person again, what that's going to look like. Um, you two are way more generous. I I hate verses ten through thirteen, but uh, so I'd recommend just skipping over those. But the rest of it, uh, in terms of this, let me just say this: I think for preachers today, we can relate to this author who's trying to again uh, correct expectations, trying to find things back in the tradition that help people deal with. Uh, a delay or a disappointment or a frustration that they perhaps didn't see coming and is saying God is still faithful, but the way in which we um, approach or encounter that faithfulness might have to change. Or at least our expectations of who and how and where God is in this moment might have to adjust, which, you know, uh, most of the preachers listening to this have had to do quite a bit of for the last eight, nine months already. So isn't that true? Um, and in the context of the other texts that were read is a recognition of wandering in a wilderness and waiting with great expectations of God to show up. 